Canada has recently experienced another significant moment in history as 45 black politicians from various political parties came together in the country's capital to engage in discussions aimed at improving the well-being of black Canadians. Tony Ains, the member of the Legislative Assembly uh, for Coal Harbour, in that month played a leading role in that event. He could share that event in Ottawa and is here in the studio with us to share some insight and proceedings of that summit. It's good to have you in the studio, Honorable. Thank you and thank you for having me and I'm honored to be here. Interesting. You've had that introduction. Uh, clearly your people should be very proud of you, uh, representing them out from Nova Scotia and being the co-chair of that event. Tell us a little bit about what transpired at that event and what was it all about, really? Well, uh, I'd like to give you a bit of context in it. Uh, 2015, how this came about. Um, I had a colleague who was the Minister of Culture in Ontario. Right. His name is Michael Cotto. He called me up and said, hey, listen, I'd like to meet with you. We're both elected. We're both ministers of cultures in two different provinces. And I'd like to, he said, this is the first time. Let's have a conversation. We had a conversation. Uh, in that conversation, I um, meeting, I presented him the book Black Ice about oh. the Colored Hockey League. He was blown away by that. He said, I didn't know. We started to talk about a few other things. He said, I didn't know that either. He then said, you know what? Just give me a moment. He took his phone out. He started Googling and he looked and he saw that there was probably at that time he called it critical mass that we had about 15 black elected officials federally and provincially, which was a first. He said, wouldn't it be nice if we could get together and, uh, you know, talk about issues facing our communities? Right. I walked away from the meeting, very arrogant. I walked away, said, it's done. I came back here. I spoke to Premier Stephen McNeil. I said, this is what I'd like to do. He said, Tony, go ahead and do it. And that's how it all began. We've had four meetings. The first meeting was in Halifax. The second was in uh, Toronto. The third was in Ottawa. The fourth, just before COVID in 2019, was in Halifax, where there was only about 12 people. And that was it. Over the la next last number of years, I was sort of hanging on to this idea, trying to keep it alive. Um, at the Mikhail, Mikhail Jean Foundation, the, uh, the, the conference here for black Canadians, right. um, I had met with some people and I said, I don't know if I can keep this alive. I'm in opposition. I don't have the funds. I don't have the staff to help me. Um, Michael Cotto then went back to Ottawa. He spoke to a couple of colleagues and it came to fruition. We, this year, have been very successful to have 45 plus, give or take, of um, black elected officials from all levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, nonpartisan, which is one of the things I believed from the very beginning it had to be, because no matter who we are, no matter what party we're in, we're all affected by the same issues. Right. And uh, we got together. It right. was a beautiful conference. Interesting. Yeah, and a lot of people would say, um, it sounds like the black community is awake and they want to take what belongs to them. Can you get us into the details of that statement that was made? Uh, what is this, what does it contain and how, how do your people understand these statements? Well, first, I'd like to say that I'm extremely proud because, you know, when we get a large group of um, any people together, especially black people, it's hard to come to consensus. You know, however... As I said, it was nonpartisan. We all came to the same consensus and we all came up with a mission statement whereby we have agreed to look at and address and go back to each of our prospective territories, constituencies, and look at the issues of anti-black racism and racism as a whole, um, looking at education, looking at 
housing, looking at health care. All these particular issues are really, really uh, important and prevalent to our community because when you look at those of us who are trying to exist in this society, in the end, we are the ones at the bottom rung of all of that and end up getting the brunt or lack of, you know, supports for any of those issues that I've just pointed out. Right. A lot of people will say that um, some politicians just gather to talk about things, but the action is not felt very long time after such meetings. What are the immediate next steps that that group is looking to put forward so that your people indeed can begin to have the impact of such a big gathering that you had? Well, one of the key things was to ensure that each of us who are in these seats right. go back to our regions and, and inform and educate community on what it is that we do and what it is that we're looking to do jointly. Um, the other thing is that we all need to work very hard at, at addressing and, 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 for example, me sitting in the legislature, I now have to bring some of those issues that were on the table to the party in power now to let them know that jointly, right across this country, we are looking at these key issues. Okay. For example, um, most recently, the current government has, uh, in my opinion, reduced the effectiveness and the ability of the Office of Equity and Anti-Racism. And what I say, they've reduced it Rather than having it as a standalone office, which it was originally intended to be, to reach out to all parts of government, right. to look at anti-black, racism, equity, all those issues is now being sort of put under a Department of Justice, which already has a very, very broad, broad mandate and, right. and is really challenging to deal with justice on its own, let alone for our people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would assume that uh, they've probably been given too much to do. So probably they'll be missing some very important aspects of what affects your people. I bet now, given the fact that you are on the uh, opposition as, as, it's, as it is currently in the House, uh, how would you measure or assess the impact of the positions that have been given to people of your community, like in the justice system? Do you think there had been some very good results in terms of delivery of justice as far as the black community is concerned? I think there has been movement. Right. I, I, I know, to give you an example, we have a very competent very smart individual who's the deputy minister of justice who was from our community however having the experience of being an only in in my role it is challenging to try to expect that she alone can you know help move that bar forward it, it will take community now, when we talk about community though, community, and if you look at many black communities, they're struggling just to meet the day-to-day -day needs. They're not gonna be focused on those larger issues. Right. Right? So, and I would say, it, even if they did have the ability to focus, there's still a lack of awareness, right. regardless of the black community, white community, Asian community, many people truly don't understand the political system right. and those who are voted in and what they do. So it all comes down to education. And our education system, in my opinion, are failing all of us because it's not addressing, I think they're taking on way too many things. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. In my statement, you can see I'm all over the place because it's there's no real easy answer for it. But I do believe 
that yeah. education has been teaching us in a way that it was set up to teach 150 years ago, and it needs to completely change. Right, absolutely. And, and you, talk, you also talked about um, the importance of uh, education, educating your people about what you do at your level and your position. But if you also touched on division within the community and how people are not together in terms of uh, what should be coming out of the community. Can you touch a little bit on that aspect and tell us how how things are spanning out as far as unity is concerned? Well, and again, you know, I'm a person who always believes that this all comes back to education. And if people are divided, it's because of lack of awareness, right. knowledge of many levels, many opportunities within communities to, to advance a move. Right. Um, when you're on social services yeah. and you're an individual that is trying to meet the needs, especially in the current climate yeah. with high inflation, gas prices, no housing, you're not going to be thinking about, you know, well, you know, what I should be looking at to see that my political representative is doing. All you're caring about is that, is this individual helping me, you know, um, subsist to right. live daily? Uh, which shouldn't be the case in, the, in any case. And we should be talking about um, a situation where we have a more representation, you know, in at such level, at such as yours. And what are you going to be doing to encourage your people to come on board, like be board members and be po participate in politics and, and take up good positions such that would impact on the community positively? Well, let me share a, one disappointment that I have. I never regret disappointment. Right. Um, is that when I was minister for eight years mm -hmm. at community events, I would try to encourage people to become more involved, get on agencies, boards, and commissions. Right. Be a part, be at the table, even if you don't know what to do. For the first year, sit there, absorb, learn. The fact that your presence is there helps to change that dynamics, right. whether you're saying anything or not. In eight years, not one individual came forward and I had the ability to instantly put them on a board, have them sit someplace. And I had many board chairs and people that were saying to me, look, our boards are pretty, you know, pretty European looking. Can we get some diversity? I tried. Our community did not. And, and that's, in my opinion, when I've spoken to some people, it's because they believed they didn't have the ability, the knowledge, and the skill sets to sit there. And I said, that's not true. You've got to learn somewhere. Right. If you can go and just sit and be there, you're going to start to get information. You will be able to. But, you know, that was the challenge. So, again, I'm going back to education. But why do you think your people are withdrawn? I mean, they don't seem to be forward, you know, in terms of participations and stuff like that. Do you think the system probably has impacted on them so negatively that they feel they're not good enough probably yes. to be on the board? That and the processes. Right. I can tell you that even if we were to encourage people to go forward, right. there were processes that were weeding us out, that were keeping us out. Right. So within government, you need to change those processes to make them more equitable, right. to make it more acceptable because there were individuals before I came in who had said to me, oh, we've tried, but we couldn't get on. We, you know, there's this because of the processes and the way they were set up to keep us out. Right. So it's, you know, to be fair, I can understand their hesitation and not wanting to because systemically, the system was set up to keep us out.
Oh, that, that's very an unfortunate situation to find yourself as a, a community. But you, you also was involved, deeply involved in the Education Reform Act uh, bill, uh, 2018 mm. or thereabout. Uh, tell us a little bit about what impact that bill has brought to your community and to the broader community around. Well, I would say that it, it's allowed us to move the bar a bit forward. Mm -hmm. However, government has changed. And in that change, I'm seeing very little of that process and that bill being implemented. For example, we talked about the effects of IPPs, independent learning. Okay. Um, on our community and the indigenous community. Right, right. Um, the current government has not even looked at it as from what I understand. Um, I'm not hearing anything. To give you an example, when the current government came into place, one of the first sessions, my first question to the education minister was, what about our community? IPPs, they're, you know, they're really affecting our community in a negative way, and what are you doing? And I, I came out a little rough, emotional. However, what had happened was no response. The only response I got from the minister, a white woman, I'm gonna say it that way, was, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I, I mean, how do you really feel? Because I'm sure you also have had some challenges, you know, being in the house, uh, being a lone voice uh, of some sort. What are those challenges? Let's get a bit personal here. You tell us a bit your experience in the house. What are the things you go through? Because you're a human being and they expect you to be the Messiah, the savior of the black community. What are those challenges and how are you working to uh, deal with them? Well, the first challenge is that, like you said, they expect you to be someone that can speak for the community. Right. I often have to remind them, I can't speak for the complete community. No. Our community is very diverse, very um, multi-eclectic within our community. And, and if, Am I, if I'm speaking, it's for a small majority. It's not for all. Right. We need to engage the community, the entire community, if we are looking to put legislation, to advance, to do anything. We need to have that conversation with the entire community. Right. Like you, you would have to do with the indigenous community with the Asian community, any community, you need to engage them. Right. And we have within, and the challenge for me was, I would say to you that often I referenced those who came before me. Often those who came before me were alone and their party didn't necessarily have the same thinking or the agenda to want to advance our community's interest. Right. I would say to you that during my time, what was different was that I've had colleagues that were willing to learn and listen and understand our community a bit better. And that's why I believe I was a little more successful. Right. That being said, um, the challenge is even within our own community, we've been so divided that there are elements within our community, like any community, right. that have their own agenda, uh -huh. that is looking for support some money yeah. for their own agenda and not for the entire community. Yeah. This, this is really, I mean, a whole lot you've said there that I sometimes feel the people should be together indeed. But what do you think that division you keep talking about has uh, done to your people, to your community? Because when people are together, they can they can do a whole lot. So in terms of advancement, how has that division uh, impacted your people? Well, it it's, it's providing the status quo. It's allowing the system 
as it is set up yeah. to continue to operate the way it has right. for the past 150, 400 years. Mm -hmm. um, to give you one example, most recently there's been a change in a definition of what it means to be African Nova Scotian. Okay. Now, the historical context of that really is about this. There were people of African descent in Nova Scotia more than 400 years ago. In the 60s, late 50s, early 60s, when there was the government allowing more immigration for work reasons, right. employment and so on, to allow people from the Caribbean, the, the um, islands and so on to immigrate to Canada. Well, what has happened due to the lack of information and in that historical context in education? Education, yeah. Um, many people and many individuals believe that we just came here then. I would gave you an example earlier where I was in uh, Ontario or Manitoba and people would say to me, go back to Jamaica. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at them with two heads and these are individuals who didn't even speak English properly. They were from other countries. So I would stop and try to give them a bit of education. No, my family's been here four generations and there's families that have been here that long. But, you know, they, they didn't care. So, but that just speaks to the larger context of us being invisible and only showing up here. Right. So when people try to identify as African Nova Scotian is with that historical context that, hey, not that you're different than us, but we're trying to show you that we've been here for this long and you may come from the continent and we're going to embrace you, which is another top of a conversation we should have because of that division. Um, however, you've got to remember that this struggle that we're facing, that you may be just facing, it's been generational for us. I, I totally agree with you on that. But as we wrap up, uh, Honorable, um, you have a lot of things probably on your table currently, on your bucket list, your wish list for your people. What are the things in the pipeline for your people? And what should you be expecting in the short or long term of your being in the house? Well, going back to one of the other questions you had asked me and quickly is moving forward, we as the Canadian Congress of Black Parliamentarians have decided to meet quarterly. Yeah. We're going to have an annual meeting. Yeah. And I can only hope and believe that each of us will go back to each of our communities, our constituents. Yeah. Because again, you have to remember, I, in my electoral district, 95%, maybe 97% white. So it's, you know, it's not many black people in my community that I need to. So I try to reach out to the uh, neighboring communities and right. try to stay contacted to yeah. say, listen, this is this is my role because black, white or whoever, yeah. when they call my office, they assume that I can do everything. And there are municipal and federal issues that often come to my 80% of my, 80 to 90% of my job is explaining my job. <laughs> you said so before, but let me just squeeze in this one. Um, your take on the North Prison elections. Do you think your people are voter educated? Uh, how well educated are they as far as politics is concerned? Listen, I can tell you looking at people face to face who told me they're not going to vote. Oh. I've had people tell me, oh yeah, I'll get there, I'll get there. And the numbers show We've got vo low voter turnout in that community and in all our black communities. And again, it goes back to us. And I have to take that on as well as the education sh system should. Yeah. Educating people on civics and, and, and what's involved in all of that. Yeah, I say but some again, they feel they're very far from the politicians. How can people contact you? I mean, if people within your community or constituents in this case, how can they contact you? How open are you or accessible are you to their people? 
I've tried to be very accessible to everyone. If you're not even in my community, my office has tried to guide you, try to tell you, okay, this you're not my constituent. However, this is where you need to go, A, B, and C, this is what you need to do. And that's the best I can do because if you're not in my riding, I can't go into um, Dartmouth South and, and try to represent you when you have somebody who's already representing you, oh, who's elected to represent yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I want to first appreciate you on this interview for pushing things aside and changing locations just to be on this show. Thank you so much, Honorable Tony, Thank you. for being on the show. Thank you. It's an honor and any time. Sounds good. Yes, and that was the Honorable Tony Ings, MLA representing Cole Abo in Dartmouth. He has shared valuable insight into the proceedings that took place in Ottawa during the recent concluded summit organized by the Canadian Congress of Black Parliamentarians. I hope I got that right. <laughs> so if you haven't already, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel and stay connected on these platforms, on our social media platforms as well, for the latest updates on community events. I am Promise Okoy, and I'll see you soon.